goes the introduction. I was supposed, I'm supposed to talk on plants. To be very frank with you all, that's one, one of my favorite topics. And 15 minutes or 20 minutes is too far or less time. But let me try and stay within that time limit. It's a matter of respecting the subject that I love the most. Quickly going into the history, plants have been around here for 500 million years. You know, human history, the earliest known human or human like, human -like animals have been around for about 200,000 years. But they have been here for a long time. If we talk of life on this planet, life on this planet has been around for about 3.6 billion years. Okay. Needless to say, plants know much about everything around us and in fact about us more than we know about, we know about ourselves. But only about 100 million years ago, what we call as the Cretaceous period, was when explosion of life happened and the flowering plants came into being. Plants with flowers, that opened new opportunities for life and life literally bursted out. It responded to that uh, development, the first flowering plants. Well, with the flowers, they came pollinators, they came seed dispersers, all kinds of things. And of course, that opened up new subjects for a lot of people like us who find interest in plants and forests and tigers and butterflies more than anything else. You know, it's awesome to study the interactions between animals and plants and way plants are driving everything. It's quite scary at one point. When I look into plants, the more, the simple fascinating thing about plants is chlorophyll, the green pigment. Uh, and, the, and why not? Plants have been the base of life, the productivity. You know, these are the only creatures that can produce food. We know how, we know, we know what is responsible for that. But all the life, all the animal life that stands on the planet together owes its existence to the plants. These are the only sing single window to trap sunlight and convert it into edible food that can be transferred down to every life forms. That's very important. We can't underestimate plants. But apart from this, the pigment chlorophyll, it says something important about us. How many of us think we know chlorophyll? Chlorophyll is that green pigment which works in sunlight, traps light and you know, uh, carbon dioxide and makes carbohydrates. That's how we know. But if you have a look at the molecular structure of chlorophyll, well, that's hemoglobin on one side, that's chlorophyll on the other side, they are not too different. It's just a matter of replacing that ferrous or the iron atom in the center with the magnesium atom and you get chlorophyll. This is the same. Plants are not different. We are not different. The basic molecule, the tra oxygen transporter that every life form requires, is more or less the same structure. Nature always works on replicating successful ideas, not inventing 10 new things to do the same thing. You know, that's what nature has been showing us. And when chlorophyll is as important as hemoglobin, why would plants want to lose it? Plants, of course, don't like anybody feeding on them. You know, simply, they don't like. That's the reason why the giraffe's neck will keep on growing. Because the plants are moving out of its reach. The plants, if you look at the tree and those African elephants in the background, well, the plants are trying to escape. And if you look at the giraffe, it's in a sad position right now. It can't reach the plants. And it's got too tall a neck to reach the grass below. You know, it's left in a lurch. That's what plants are doing. They're driving evolution at the same time. They are making sure that you get the resource and you have to go through, jump through hoops. You have to have a tough time. The monkeys, the langurs to be very specific, they are leaf eaters. They eat a lot of leaves. Plants don't like them. So plants have to fight with them. And plants, of course, cannot do dishum dishum, but they have their own ways of fighting. And plants use a lot of chemicals. A lot of toxic warfare that goes on. Well, there was a study. I would just like to point to you. Uh, some students were monitoring langur feeding patterns in South India and what they saw was when the langur were feeding on plants, they settled in one area, for some time they fed off the leaves over there, then the langurs moved and they moved quite far off. They moved very, very far off. Okay. 
that brought another question into mind. What was happening? Why were the langus moving? Why were the langus not happy with those plants over there anymore? When investigations were done, they found that all those plants had released a battery of toxins to make those langurs run away. The langurs couldn't handle those toxins in the system. They had to move out. But why did the langurs move far off? That's another question. The langurs had to move far off because the plants in the immediate vicinity were showing, were already knowing that the langurs are going to come to them. Somehow, they knew that, and they had already built up those toxins. They had anticipated the langur movement predator movement to them. That's why the langurs had to move really far distance. That's awesome. Plants can communicate. That's what we now know. It was just last year that this paper was released in the journal Nature to show that plants do communicate using intensive, in, intrinsic, intricate roots and fungal networks. And that's how plants can communicate threats. They can communicate all the things that they want to. You know, plants are rocking. They are doing everything that we can't even imagine to do. The whole world got together some years back and we hanged Saddam Hussein because we thought he had chemical weapons. Nobody found them, but plants are using them more than anybody else. To protect themselves, to protect their babies, these red seeds over here, Four of those seeds, grounded, consumed, can kill you. Yeah, but the plant produce the, produces them in ample amount. The message is very clear, leave my babies alone, leave my seeds alone. Paternal care or maternal care, whatever we call parental care, is not a quality exclusive to humans, as many would like to think. Plants go some crazy distances. I cannot, of course, give you all the examples over here, but the pod on the, the green pod there, I can use the point to the green pod there, is of khujli. Anybody knows khujli? That khujli powder? The hairs on those pods is what gets you the powder. Okay, and all that nasty, irritating hair is not for college pranks. It's basically to protect the young ones that are inside the pods. Okay, and, this, and plants take paternal care or parental care very seriously. Well, plants do a lot of mathematics. They have to, okay? Growing up against gravity, standing tall in front of force of rain, rain is not easy to do. So a lot of maths. Da Vinci knew it 500 years back. He stated his theory. It was later theorized and put into the fractal theory. Basically, that's what plants do. Once they hit upon a shape, they keep on repeating that shape in different magnitudes so that each point has the same probability of breaking when they are subjected to same force. Okay, that's how plants get their stability. You won't want to have plants as your bosses because they really make you run around. That worker honeybee, to get its daily quota of food, has to visit about 4,000 flowers in a single day. Because the amount of nectar in the flower is calculated. It's just enough so that the bee feels happy that it came to the flower, but it's not enough to satisfy the bee. So the bee has to fly to another flower, to another flower, and when it flies from one flower to another, the energy that the bee has acquired from the last flower is likely to be expended. So the bee, most likely, is going to go hungry at the end of the day because all the energy that she has acquired is going to be spent. Okay, that's why the worker bee the worker honeybee barely lives for about four days. She dies of, it dies of pure wear and tear and plants make it do. You know, they get more weirder. These guys, the bee orchid. The bee orchid is called a bee orchid because this flower mimics a bee, a female bee. Not only physical mimicry, but this or flower in, which is found in the temperate climates, produces the exact same chemicals that a female bee produces to attract males to mate with it. Weird. Yeah? Weird. Sex for favors? That's it. Yeah? And poor males, you can imagine, this is not some, you know, optical mimicry or something. This is chemicals, so the call of hormones cannot be alluded to. You have to go there, you have to mate, 
you have to do everything you have to be as forlorn at the end of the day you know because you are all meeting with the wrong things you know so another interesting thing is how do plants know what is happening in the bees balls you know what interests the bees how do they know it it's quite weird and that's why i say that plants know much about ourselves than we know about ourselves as well you know these guys are amazing the other guy the other flower over there it's a fly trap it's very well found in the sanjay gandhi national park it's not a carnivore but it just traps insects it provides them with a lot of food but traps them till they get hungry again and then releases them back so that it goes into another flower and has no other choice but to go into another flower plants are achieving pollination by doing all these things imagine you know all the human morals values criminal justice system they all happen to break down when it comes to plants everything is destroyed plants are doing every trick in the book to live to live the life now fig trees and fig wasp they are tied to each other one brilliant artist called rohan chakravarti help me put together this illustrations we'll just quickly run through them the flowers are inside what we call the fig not available for any other pollinators to access but only the fig wasp where is it the fig wasp she is the only one who can access it and she enters in there is no escape there is no escape when she is in there is no escape she goes in she pollinates some of the flowers she lays eggs on the rest she dies within that fig so all you vegetarians watch it out before eating a fig yeah the young ones grow they eat on the ripening flower parts inside they come out as new males and females they do all their mating dating business inside the fig the male is a pretty useless creature because he has no wings most of the males in insects in the invertebrate world are quite useless okay they are produced only because they want to transfer the sperms otherwise they are not needed ants have done away with them they don't need males but that's what happens the male cannot fly out but they mate they go out the female leaves the fig only to go to another fig pollinate start the same cycle again what this means is in short that the new female must find another fig tree which is fruiting so that it can continue its generation that means she has to waste no time she has to find the fig plants are driving this by a lot of chemicals okay there is quite a restriction to what that small insect can fly, fly and how long can it fly but what that does is at any given time in a ecosystem or in a forest like sanjay gandhi national park there has to be some or the other tree fig tree which is fruiting and thereby making sure that availability of food is always maintained at a constant there is no drop in the availability of food in an ecosystem that's why figs are very very important but this is an interplay that's guiding it okay the relation between the fig and the wasp is what is guiding this and that's why figs are keystones in an ecosystem they are irreplaceable well i just read this line in the morning you know we have we will keep on arguing about this but that's just intelligence and its correlation to the brain uh, is too much an oversimplification you know not necessary like urine is a product of kidneys intelligence need not be a product of just the brains there has to be something because in plants there is no brain there is no single part which you can call brain or there is no not even a no somewhere nothing you know no ganglions as we find them in cockroaches nothing but they solve they do some of the most complex things they respond they are sentimental they are quite intelligent and all that without a brain but believe me every time when scientists sit together to decide who is the intelligent life form the winner is man human beings because all the decision makers are human beings so we find an escape route every now and then and we become the most intelligent creatures thank you